1 Thessalonians. 1 Thessalonians chapter number 5. <clears throat> now I'm going to tell you as we head into this, this message was born in my heart this afternoon. Uh, I did not have even the thought of it or anything concerning it until after the, the service this morning. <clears throat> after this morning's service, I would say that this morning was a tremendous service. Uh, the number of people in here was exciting. It was wonderful to see the pews filled. Uh, to hear the, the voice of the choir and to, then to hear the congregational music uh, sing out and praising the Lord, and knowing what we had gone through yesterday with the community event and such a wonderful turnout, more than we even expected for that. The salvations, the people, we hope, of course, always that when somebody uh, confesses Christ or says that they prayed and asked Jesus into their heart, we hope that every one of them got saved. It's possible and likely that some uh, were merely going through emotion. But to have people raise their hand yesterday and then this morning to, to have five people raise their hand. Uh, Brant and I were talking earlier and we concluded that there, there was a possible sixth person there because we weren't sure if they were moving around or if they were responding to the question that was posed uh, but even if it was only five, even if it was only four, even if out of all of them, only one of them truly accepted Christ, it was a service to rejoice in. And yet after all of that, there was I walked back into my office after lunch and I was overcome with a burden of sorrow because though I rejoiced that some people accepted Jesus Christ as their Savior, it was not the ones that I was praying for that were in this auditorium this morning, that I was pleading with the Lord to save them. It wasn't the ones that I've been praying for for time and time again. It wasn't for the, the ones that, that got saved this morning were not the ones that I've been asking God for years to save. Uh, the ones that will listen through live stream or through the, uh, uh, the video recording. But those did not accept Jesus Christ as their Savior and what I did, I went to the Lord and said, Lord, I'm excited that you have saved souls. I mean, that's what it's all about. And there's, I'm not taking anything away from that. But Lord, when will you hear my prayer for that? Should I just quit praying for those that we've been praying for? And the Lord said this to me, pray again. And so tonight I want to take you to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. And tonight we're going to, uh, that very thing, pray again. We need more praying. We need more praying in this country. We need more praying in the home. We need more praying in this church. We need more praying. And there's not a one of us in here that would say that they pray enough. It's just, it's a matter of fact. We get so distracted in life that we don't pray enough. Boy, I, I feel almost guilty to stand up and to, and to have this burden on my heart. But I know that it's from God. I know that God is compelling me, pushing me forward. And, and uh, somebody made a comment to me earlier, to, uh, uh, earlier today. A preacher texted me and made a comment and said, uh, matter of fact, he called me and I talked to him on the phone briefly and his comment was the same as the text. He said, listen, what's going on there means the devil's coming after you and if you're not prayed up, he's going to get you. He's going to get you. He's coming after. We need to pray Again, 1 Thessalonians 5.17, and we're going to come back to it, and we're going to be all over the place, but that one verse we know so very well. Verse number 17, pray without ceasing. John Bunyan said, He who runs from God in the morning will scarcely find him the rest of the day. And I would venture to say that most people, first thing in the morning, are already in America, are already wheels turning so busy they don't have time for God. They don't have time to pray. And if we pray, our praying is not really proper and it's not really sufficient so often we begin our day and soon find ourselves too busy to pray or at the very least too busy to pray properly or sufficiently. I suppose men who pray fervently are not as common as those who pray often. For it's the, with the fervor that lends to the promise in the scriptures of availing much. 
God says in, in James chapter 5, I believe it is, He says, uh, The effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. And so this afternoon as I got before the Lord in my office and began to uh, come before Him, just ask Him, God, well, what needs to happen? He said, Pray more fervently, with fervor. Don't just pray. Pray with fervor. I was so excited that people got saved this morning. But can I say this? There was one in particular that I knew needed the Lord Jesus Christ as their Savior. And to my surprise, through most of the message this morning, there was tears in the eye. And I, I began to just, even as I was preaching, I was praying, God, let him, let him get saved, let him get saved, let him get saved. And they're not the one that raised the hand. And God said, pray again. Pray again. I want to show you, I just put down a few simple points uh, this afternoon in my office concerning this, this idea, pray again. We must pray again. Pray again, my dear friends. The challenge is pray again. Pray again, number one, in rejoicing. Philippians 4, 6 says, Be careful for nothing but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving let your requests be made known unto God both before and after our text verse the verse previous says rejoice evermore then it says pray without ceasing and then you find that word thanks again in verse 18 and everything give thanks right there smack dab in the middle of rejoicing and giving thanks God says pray without ceasing you know what that made me realize as I was in my office just talking to the Lord, there's times we come before God with real, real things on our heart. But there's, it's almost like we come burdened. Set, and, and rightfully so. I mean, this, this world's full of turmoil, pain, sorrows. God says, come with thanks. Come with thanksgiving. Rejoice evermore. Hey, come before God rejoicing. When was the last time when you prayed you came before him rejoicing. This morning after the service, the first thing I did was pray with thanksgiving, rejoicing at the souls that were saved, rejoicing at this auditorium being full, rejoicing that God was beginning to answer some of our prayers, but not very long after that. Matter of fact, immediately following my prayer began to take a turn to other things, pains and sorrows in other people's lives and our lives. But friends, we must pray again in rejoicing. I'm trying to compel you this, this evening to turn ourselves back to God with fervent prayer. Fervent prayer. Pray again. Pray again with, uh, in rejoicing. Number two, pray again in retreating. Now this, this very thing here is one that I suppose many people are in danger of neglecting. The Bible tells us in um, Matthew chapter 6, Jesus speaking lends ear to how we ought to pray. And he says this, But thou, when thou prayest, enter into thy closet. And when thou hast shut thy door, pray to thy Father which is in secret. And thy Father which seeth in secret shall reward thee openly. But when ye pray, use not vain repetitions as the heathen do, for they think that they shall be heard for their much speaking. Be not, uh, be not ye therefore like unto them, for your Father knoweth what things ye have need of before ye ask him. Jesus is saying here, listen, when you're going to pray, it's time you get into a little closet space, a little secret place, and spend some time on your face. There's some things, and I didn't want to dwell here, but I, I say this, this evening, we need some more closet praying. We have Christians whose only prayers are at the dinner table and their only public prayers are, 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 are public prayers at church. Their only praying time is in the church house or at the dinner table. Friends, we need to get back to some closet praying. We need, to, we need to retreat and get to a place alone with God and begin to implore and beg God to save our family. To save our family. The only way we're going to see them turn to God is by praying again. Don't quit praying. It's easy. I mentioned my father this morning. I mention him all the time. When I'm out talking to somebody, I tell them about if I meet a Christian and when I'm door knocking or something, I say, and they always ask me, can I pray for you? Yes, I want you to pray for my dad. 
He's lost and he's on his way to hell. I want him to get saved. Thousands of people around this country, even around the world, I've got friends in Myanmar and India, they're praying for my dad to get saved. There's been times through the years where I got tired of praying about it. The Lord's not going to hear me. What's the point of praying on? God said, pray again. Pray again. Retreat into a private place. Have a place where you go. The significance of the closet isn't uh, just a place where you go to, to pray. It's not a, just some special room there. The significance of the closet is it's a place of intimacy, a place where you step into an enclosed area. Nothing else can distract you. You're alone with God, and you're before God. In that nearness of God, you bring yourself before that Holy One who will hear your prayers. The significance is Jesus says, listen, keep praying. You need to find you a place where you can get alone with God. God said, be still and know that I am God. The reason we, we've gotten away from the closet praying, from retreating praying, when we, we go, you know what made Bobby Robertson so great? I don't know if you know Bobby Robertson. The Gospel Light Baptist Church, one of the biggest, at one point they were running, uh, 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 I think he said they were running about 5,000 uh, people in Sunday school. Tremendous church, the sword of the Lord has a big conference at his church. He's passed on here recently. But he told me the key, the success is prayer. You know how he got started in ministry and why God blessed him? He had a place of retreating. He said early on, he realized that if he didn't get alone with God and keep praying and keep praying, that nothing would get accomplished. He'd get overrun with the, the task before him. And so he had a place out in the woods behind Gospel Light Baptist Church. He would go back out there, and, they, and he, would, he knew exactly how to get there, and there was a stump on the ground. And he began to come out to that stump, and sometimes he'd stand on the stump, and sometimes he'd kneel at the stump. And soon men realized that God was touching his life because of his prayer, and so they began to follow him. And those are the men who became his deacons. They followed him out there because God said, come out here alone, retreat away, and get before me. And he he said he would, he would get on his hands and knees and uh, uh, he would lift up his hands and just begin praying aloud in the woods. Alone with God, he was in retreat, praying again. And we need tonight some men and some women who will pray again in retreat. Get alone with God, I'm talking about. That's what that retreat is, is getting away from the, the things of this life, the distractions, the people even. It, it, it's a wonderful thing to have prayer time with my family. But there are times when I need to go. Sometimes I'm in this in my office, and even that, that office, the, the phone calls can come in. It's not alone enough. And I've got to get up and go walk somewhere else to another room where there's nothing in there. There's no contact. Nobody would ever look for me in there just so I can, I can call out to God, and I know I'm in that closet space. God said, pray again. Pray again. We're in a desperate time what God's doing here is a wonderful thing there's nobody here that would disagree look at all he's done over the last few months is it nothing short of a miracle miracle after miracle it's it, God is doing wonderful things but he says pray again that's what he told me this afternoon when I looked to him and said God why not the ones that we've been so focused on and praying that they'd get saved why haven't they come to you he said, pray again. Pray as if everything depends on God. Then work as if everything depends on you, Martin Luther said. Pray as if everything depends on God. Then work as if everything depends on you. Too often we dump our prayers and run, but this is not how it ought to be. We must put legs on our prayers. If you pray for a job but you don't apply, then it is vain praying. If you pray for finances to cover your bills, then you won't work the extra hours, then those prayers are vain. The same would be true, I suppose, if you are praying for money and then you, and then you uh, start working on the Lord's Day. And, and don't, don't, uh, you, you expect that's going to take care of it. No, you're just going to find yourself away from God and back in trouble. There must be a time of coming apart, trusting God in that retreated uh, place of prayer. But we must be people of action. Too often times we say, Lord, save so-and-so. And yet we don't go out and soul winning that, and doing our job and our duty. That's putting legs on the prayer. I want to move on. Pray again. 
Number three, in respect. In respect. I didn't think I had an issue with this until this afternoon when I was on my face before the Lord. And I realized that I was coming before a holy, holy, holy God as though he was almost as though he was a genie in a bottle. And, and I, I'm not that way, you see, but, but the Lord showed me that I wasn't coming to him as the holy God that he is. And my dear friends, it's high time we get back to praying again as though the one that we're praying to is God. I'm talking about the God when they translated the scriptures that they would lay down the pen when they wrote his name and they'd pick up a new pen because it wasn't worthy to use that. That pen was so sacred because it wrote the name of God. That's the kind of reverence I'm talking about. When we pray, it ought to be in respect to a holy God. Sometimes folks pray as though God is lucky to have them and as though he owes them something. The one to whom we pray to is holy, holy, holy. In Matthew chapter 6, in those verses that follow the ones I read just a moment ago, the very next verse says, and this is Jesus still speaking, says, After this manner, pray, therefore pray ye, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. And give us this our daily bread. Jesus says, this kingdom isn't yours. It's his. So when you pray, pray like it's his kingdom. Pray like you're asking him to do something in his kingdom that belongs to him. Not doing your bidding because you've asked him to. When you pray, pray again and asking him, realizing that it ought to be his will, not ours. That's what he just preached on. Dying to self, dying daily, Paul mastered giving God his kingdom and his will in his life. And though the shipwrecks come and the vipers come and all the trials and troubles and the stonings and the beatings and the whippings and everything that came and he was left for dead, yet Paul could come back and say, I'll trust God because this is his kingdom and I'm his vessel. And he believed God because he had a reverence for God. He knew, you see, that's the one quality trait of Jews is they know who God is. They're confused about where their Savior comes into the timeline. They're confused on who Jesus is, but they know God the Father who sits on the throne is a holy God, and they make much about not taking his name in vain. Jesus, in verse 11 of chapter, Matthew chapter 6, says, Give us this day our daily bread. His food source, not ours. You know, that struck me, Miss Sue, as I was talking to the Lord this afternoon. And I went to this, this verse because when you want to know, uh, when you're talking to the Lord about praying and you're praying and you want to know what he has to say, you turn into the Bible to seek his words because that's Jesus, that's God speaking to us. He is the word. And when he said, give us this day, our day of the bread, you say, well, that doesn't sound much about praying. But then I realize that when he's, he's telling us to give us this day our daily bread, we're not talking about a physical food. We're asking God to give us manna from heaven. And when it's him that we seek, then we find ourselves reverencing every word that he says. And then we find ourselves respecting him and the person that he is. Number four, pray again in repentance. If you spend even just a moment of time alone with the Lord in prayer and in, in the Bible, it does not take long before you realize there's some things in your life that need to be brought before Him. And I'm, I'm terribly afraid that we have people who have things in their life and they know they're there. They know they're there. But they're praying to the Lord as though He's not going to see it He's not going to, you know, the thing with my children is they can, they can get into things. And they're good now at being able to, to kind of hide it and displace it. 
But I always can, I can tell something's wrong by, I can look at the area and notice something. Sometimes I can smell something's off. If it's, if it's some kind of food source or something. Sometimes I can look at the way things are done and their character is out of order. Did you know that God can do that with you? He looks on your heart. He sees when things are wrong. And yet we go about our life. And I'm terribly afraid that this is where the church is today. We pray without praying in repentance. With a repentant heart. In Luke chapter 18, verse number 13 and 14, the Bible tells us, gives us this illustration of the publican standing afar off would not lift up so much his eyes into heaven but smote upon his breath saying God be merciful to me a sinner I tell you this man that Jesus says went down to the house justified rather than the other for every one that exalteth himself shall be abased and he that humbleth himself shall be exalted we need to pray again but we need to pray again in repentance Knowing this, 1 John 1, 9 says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. But then it says this, and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Brother Randy, sometimes I feel like maybe we have things in our life that when we pray, we're not willing to have that removed out of our life. There's some things that we're going to leave that in our life. I mean, yes, it might be a struggle to get rid of it. And truth be told, we know that God will cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we will just bring it before him and lay it before him, we know he'll remove it from our life. But we're not willing to get rid of it. And so when we pray, we don't pray in repentance. And it hinders our prayers. We often don't really want to get uh, let go of those things that are keeping our prayers from getting through brings to mind a story about a little fella, one who had been sent to his room because he had been bad. A short time later, he came out and said to his mother, I've been thinking about what I did, and I said a prayer. That's fine, she said. If you ask God to make you good, he'll help you. Oh, I didn't ask him to help me be good, replied the boy. I asked him to help you put up with me. And isn't that how we do God sometimes? Lord, this thing needs to stay in my life because I'm not willing to let it go. Not knowing, friends, that the very thing that you're holding on to may be the very reason that so-and-so in your life isn't coming to God, isn't repenting because that your prayers aren't getting through when you're begging him and pleading with him for that person to get saved, that begging with him and pleading with him that he would send someone along to harvest. My dear friends, your prayers may not be getting through because you're not praying in repentance. Revelation 2, 4, Jesus speaking, Nevertheless, I somewhat against thee, speaking to this church, because thou hast left thy first love. Remember, therefore, from whence thou art fallen, and repent, and do the first works, or else I will come quickly unto thee, uh, unto thee quickly, and will remove thy candlestick out of his place, except thou repent. Twice he says, repent, repent. You've left your first love. I don't think anybody in here tonight is lost, but I'd not be doing my duty if I did not remind you that if you have not put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, the Bible tells us that we must repent to get saved. It's not a one, two, three, repeat after me. There must be a turning away. There must be repentance. Luke 13, 3, I tell you, Jesus speaking, nay, but except you repent, ye shall all likewise perish. And then lastly, number five, Praying again in righteousness. In righteousness. You say, well, that's uh, interesting. I, I don't know. What do you mean by that? Well, if you don't pray in repentance, you certainly can't get to this praying in righteousness. But you see, it's the culmination of everything that we've already gone through. It's the culmination of all the Word of God working in us, the Spirit of God moving in our hearts that leads us to this moment because the process of sanctification is taking place and how much we resist will determine how much our prayer life is affected and how often we come before God and how much He's hearing our prayers come to His throne. We must be praying in righteousness to have an effect in this life. Those who have clean hands and visit often with the Lord 
will delight in the Lord as they see their fruit brought forth. Many come praying without being clean. And though the Bible tells us that if we have iniquity, then he'll not hear our prayers. The Bible also tells us what the opposite does. And I've already quoted part of this verse, James 5, 16. Confess your faults one to another and pray for one another that you may be healed. That's the first part of the verse. Pray for one another that you may be healed. Then it says the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. And this was what brought me before my face before God. That there was something missing that I must pray again, that I must pray again, and that I must pray again, and that I must pray again, that I must pray again, in order that these people might be saved, in order that some of those who are struggling with health problems, I must pray again in righteousness, in repentance. I must continue to come before God. In his book, Sit, Walk, Stand, Watchman Nee describes a preaching mission to an island off the uh, South China coast. There were seven in the ministering group, including a 16-year-old new convert who he calls Brother Hu. The island was fairly large, containing about 6,000 homes. Nee had a, con a, a contact there, an old schoolmate of his, who was headmaster of the village school. But he refused to house the group when he discovered that they had come to preach the gospel. Finally, they found lodging with a Chinese herbalist who became their first convert. Preaching seemed quite fruitless on the island. And Ni discovered it was because of the dedication of the people to their idol they called Te Wong. They were convinced of his power because on, this, on the day of his festival and parade each year, the weather is always near perfect. Brother William comes to the piano. When, the, when is the procession this year? Young Wu asked a group that had gathered to hear them preach. It is fixed for January 11th at 8 in the morning, was the reply. This is a true story, by the way. Then said the new convert, I promise you that it will certainly rain on the 11th. At that, there was an outburst of cries from the crowd. That is enough. We don't want to hear any more preaching. If there is rain on the 11th, then your God is God. Watchman Nee had been elsewhere in the village when this confrontation had taken place. Upon being informed about it, he saw that the situation was serious and called the group to prayer. On the morning of the 11th, there was not a cloud in the sky. But during grace for breakfast, sprinkles began to fall. And there followed a heavy rain. Worshippers of the idol to Wang were so upset that they placed it in a sedan chair and carried it out, outdoors, hoping this would stop the rain. Then the rain increased. After only a short distance, the carriers of idol stumbled and fell, dropping the idol and fracturing the jaw and left arm. A number of young people turned to Christ as a result of the rain coming in answer to prayer. But the elders of the village made divination and said to the wrong, uh, that the wrong day had been chosen. That the proper day of the procession, they said, should have been the 14th. And when Nia and his friends heard this, they again went to prayer, asking for rain on the 14th and for clear days for preaching until then. That afternoon, the sky cleared, on, uh, uh, cleared and on the good days that followed, there were 30 converts. Uh, on the crucial test day, Nia said, says, uh, the 14th broke, another perfect day. We had good meetings. And as the evening approached, we met again at that appointed hour. We quietly brought the matter to the Lord's remembrance. Not a minute late, his answer came with torrential rain and floods as before. The power of the idol over the islanders was broken. The enemy was defeated. Believing prayer had brought a great victory. Conversions followed. And the impact upon the servants of God who had witnessed his power, would continue to enrich their Christian service from that time on. Perhaps our prayer should be more like knees. More, maybe it should be more like this. Lord, I renounce my desire for human praise, for the approval of my peers, the need for public recognition. I deliberately put 
these aside today, content to hear you whisper, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Oh, my dear friends, we need to pray again. We've not done enough in prayer. We've not bathed this life in prayer like we're commanded to. When you've prayed, get off your knees and pray again. And when you step into the next room, pray again. And when you're going about the task of the day, pray. And before you get in bed, pray. Before you fall asleep, pray again. And as you wake up, pray again before your feet ever touch the floor. The only way we're going to overcome the devil and his uh, tyrants that are running wild through this nation, the only way we're going to see our family and friends get saved is if we pray again. We cannot quit. We cannot cease. Matter of fact, the Bible commands us, God commands us to pray without ceasing. I challenge you with this. We give money to a missionary, but how much have you prayed for them? They've done the task of taking the gospel to a foreign land. Have you prayed for them? Have you prayed for your neighbor? Have you prayed for your boss? Have you prayed for your sons and daughters, grandchildren? Glory you tonight. Pray again. Would you stand to your feet and your head, ba- uh, head bowed and eyes closed? This moment of invitation. Don't be content. Don't be satisfied with the results of things going on in your life where you're but just a moment away from utter chaos.